11, that's where we're going to be today, 2 Samuel chapter 11, a story that whether you are a believer or not will recognize, and I'll never forget when I left Bruce High School and went to Ole Miss, I took Philosophy 101 and kind of wrecked my world, but I really enjoyed it. And one of those guys who just really enjoys torturous education. And so I took the next level of philosophy called logic. Now, I, I didn't know what logic was. They didn't train me that way at Bruce High School. So I just wanted to try it out. And it was a combination of words, English, science, and math. And uh, looking back, it was, a, it was a treacherous course, but I learned a lot. We talked about these things called syllogisms. We talked about uh, modal logic. And modal statements provide a framework for understanding how to reason related to possibilities and probability. For example, if it's raining, then the streets will be wet. All right, that's logic. See, you are a logical person regardless of what your husband or wife says. You are a logical person. And so 2 Samuel chapter 11 this morning is going to give us one of the most powerful and profound logical formulas of all time. And we don't even realize it. It's the formula that will make your life better and students, kids, it will make you better at life, all right? This is a powerful, logical formula. If you do this, then this will happen. I want to talk to you today about a message entitled The Progressive Path to Regrettable Sin. The Progressive Path to Regrettable Sin. I thought about naming it how to have an affair, but that would not be a good sermon for church. So the progressive path to regrettable sin. Now back on Palm Sunday, we got to go back a long way, all the way two weeks ago, we discovered that David was a chosen one by the prophet Samuel and anointed as the next king of Israel. He slayed Goliath. He is heralded as God's man. I mean, he's the guy after God's own heart. He was a man of courage. He was a man of character. This guy had it all. He was hard-nosed. He was humble. He was gritty, and he was gifted. He was the greatest poet of all time. David, he was God's guy. He was the best. He was the brightest. Yet in the midst of being the greatest, he had the most regrettable sin that led to the most regrettable season of all times. And this is where we learn about this logical formula. And so if you're taking notes this morning, there are three postures of the heart. Three postures of the heart that will lead us towards sin. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this will save your marriage. This will save your life. This will save the entire future of your life. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Number one, the first posture of this logical sequence is this, a casual state. A casual state. Look, listen. David became flippant and frivolous over the things that matter most. He was in a casual state. Now, now I want us to look in 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It tells us how important of a season this was. In the spring of the year, verse 1 says... The time when kings go out to battle. This was not a casual time. This was not a frivolous time. David's supposed to be on the front lines leading the battle against the enemies of God. Yet he was being casual. He was just hanging out at home. He chose comfort over calling. 
He's just being casual. And the irony of it all is that when he was a teenager, he was fighting for the Lord. Now that he's a qualified man of God, military adult, now he's fighting against the Lord because he's casual. He's living in his own sense of comfort. Why? Look, David took off his armor. He took off his armor. Bible drillers, Ephesians 6, he took off the armor of God, and that led him into a state of vulnerability because he had no accountability. He took his armor off. He didn't show up for the fight. He started coasting in the call of God in his life. My, my, my dad, my football coaching dad would say he'd been lollygagging around. I grew that. I mean, I grew up hearing that all the time. Like, quit lollygagging around and get up. Now, I don't know what lollygagging is, but it, I, knew, I know the context, so I really know what it means. So David was lollygagging around, and verse 1, look, look at what it says. So when the kings go out to battle, David, he didn't want to go himself, so what did he do? He sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David did what? He remained in Jerusalem. He was being casual. God, I know I'm supposed to be on the battlefield. But pff, let's just send somebody else to do the work that you called me to do. I want to choose to be lazy. I want to choose to do what's right in my own eyes. I want to just stay here. And David doesn't realize the cost of that statement, the weight of what that's going to bring into his life in the future. The cost is so much worse than subverting his responsibility to be on the front lines. I mean, his cost is more than he can bear. Now, adults know this, and kids, you're going to learn it the hard way. But look, being at the wrong place at the wrong time is always where your greatest regret happens. Look, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know your past. Praise God, I don't. So I'm not talking to your past. But... Isn't it true your greatest regret happened in a place you were not supposed to be at a time you were not supposed to be there? And that's exactly where David is. He's in a casual state. And that leads to number two. He's in a casual state, but number two, he's got a careless spirit. He's got a careless spirit. So what happened when David was in a casual state and had a careless spirit? Verse 2 says, it happened. It happened. What happened? The thing that you thought never would have happened because you were in a place you weren't supposed to be at a time you weren't supposed to be there. And yet, it happened. The unimaginable happened to God's anointed one, the best and the brightest, was vulnerable to the thing that would hurt the most. It happened, but look at when it happened. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch. David He's just laying on the couch all day. And, and the text says that's when it happened. His mind was wandering, not doing what he should have been doing. Lax and lazy and lollygagging. The armor was off and the pajamas were on. Because he lost his call and his commitment. He was idle 
And he omitted to do what God had called him to do. Now, kids, listen, this is so important. If you're doing what you should not be doing, listen, if you're doing what you should be doing, you'll never do what you shouldn't be doing. I mean, okay, Mr. State the Obvious. But it's so powerful. If you're doing what you should be doing, you'll never do what you shouldn't be doing. I know, I, I, you know I, I've been to school most of my life, but this is profound for me, all right? It's profound. Now, I want you to flip over real quick to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24. This is such an important verse that the wisest man to ever live teaches us. Book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 33. Verse 33 says this. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And here's the logical result. Look at verse 34. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Now look, the worst thing that can happen to being lazy is not poverty. That's not what this is saying. What's worse is looking at God face to face, and when God asks you, what did you do with what I have given you, how will you then respond? How will you respond? What are you going to say, I wasted everything you gave me, and I subverted all of my responsibilities. I mean, I know I can sing, but Laura's such a great recruiter, I don't have to be a part of the choir, because look how amazing it is. No, you're subverting your God-given responsibility and giftedness to someone else. Look, I, I know that you've called me to be a Sunday school teacher, but there's no way I can be the Sunday school teacher like Woody Jones. He is just amazing. He's my mentor. Yeah, but God has given you a specific gift, a specific testimony that you can make just as much of an impact as anybody else. Don't subvert the responsibility of what God has called you to do, and that's exactly what David did. He said, lost it all. Now, it, it's interesting how we look at this text and we, we say, well, you know, of course, if you're lazy, you know, you'll be poor, but, but this is it's not really what the, I mean, yes, it's true, but it's not necessarily what uh, the, the text is saying. The text is, is trying to say, don't try to, maximize your free money and minimize your work money. Does that make sense? Don't just, just try to have handouts everywhere you look. Maximize your work load, minimize your lazy mode. In other words, poverty begins because all of your riches are in the wrong stuff. Being rich is not about money. It's not about treasures on earth. Being rich is about treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Now, uh, me, me and the family last week, we, we like to play these games. We're just sitting in the living room, TV off, playing games, right? What if? What would you do? You know, what, what would you do if you had a billion dollars? That's something to think about. Like, What would you do if you had a billion dollars? If suddenly Chad was a billionaire? What in the world would you do? And, you know, everybody kind of went around the room and everybody answered. And they all knew what I was going to say. They knew it because they know my personality, right? And uh, I said, I'll be honest with you. I said, I would drive the 2009 Yukon and I would still be the pastor of First Baptist Church in Calhoun City. And nobody in Calhoun County would know I'm a billionaire because everybody would be calling me up. <laughs> they'd be call and they'd be calling you up, right? Look, where are your riches? 
And I'm not saying it's wrong to have a billion dollars. Good night. If you have a billion dollars, we are so honored that you're here at our church. You know, there's this Bible verse talks about a tenth of what you give, and we'd love to take that tenth and, you know, pay some things off. But, but it's not about money. It's about where your heart is. And, and here's the important part. If you lose God's calling every time when you become casual and careless of the things of God. And so we wonder... We wonder, church, why people are, are just casual to the things of God. And we expect them to obey God's calling, not when they're casual, not when they are careless. And David finds himself in a casual and careless situation. And listen, this is when temptation is the most dangerous, right? This is where temptation is the most dangerous. So verse 2, it happened... Late one afternoon, when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. Now look, if David was where he was supposed to be, would he have even been tempted? No. The answer is no. He was where he was not supposed to be. And furthermore, his thought process was in the gutter. He could have said, whoa, my eyes, no. Where's God's word? I need to read God's word. I need to go do some push-ups. I need to, like, change views. But that's not what he did. He looked back, and then the text says, the woman was very beautiful. So his spirit was so careless that he allowed this lust to take over. Church, capture your thoughts. The thought that David allowed, the thought that David allowed became the thing that David acted. Whatever captures your attention will go 18 inches to your affection and go to your feet that becomes your action. This is that progressive nature that sin will take you down, which tells us, look, what we think about, our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. This was the case of David. It's the case for us. Look at verse 3. And David sent and inquired about the woman. It's his fault. It's his fault. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, Uriah, the Hittite? He starts excusing away and escaping his sin. So, number one, he has a casual state. Number two, he has a careless spirit, which will lead us invariably to number three, a callous soul. A callous soul. We see this logical sequence, this progression down. Look, Pandora's box of sin. That, that's where we're going. Pandora's box of sin. Look at verse, verse 4. It's, it's when it explodes. So David sent his messengers. He took her. She came to him, and he lay with her. She had been purifying herself for uncleanliness. So in other words, it's, it's going to be David's baby. Uh, then she returned to her house, verse 5. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Wow, wow, wow. David is surprised. How in the world did this happen? And it all happens in an instant. It blows up in a moment, all because David allowed his thoughts, David allowed his attention David allowed his laziness, his omitting to do what God had called him to do. David has allowed all of this to culminate to this point of a most regrettable. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a snowball. Sin is like a snowball going down the mountain. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It starts small and it ends significantly. So the logical progression is this. A casual state leads to a careless spirit that becomes a callous soul. 
A casual state leads to a careless spirit that becomes a callous soul. And some of you here, if you're honest, you're, you've got a, ca a callous soul. You know why? Because you've been careless and you've been casual about the things of God. This is where David finds himself. So my question to you, church, where are you on this path of progressive sin? Are, are you casual to the things of God? You casual to prayer? You casual to church? You casual to the things that matter most? You casual to your family? Where are you on the state? Because if you're casual, it will lead you to become careless. And that careless spirit will lead to a callous soul. And I know many of you have walked down this path, and maybe you're in this path, and you say, Chad, you are exactly right. I feel hopeless. I don't know what to do. I don't even know who I am anymore. I don't feel like I have a soul. I'm callous. Sin has destroyed my life. It's destroyed my joy. And what do I do now? That's a great question. And that's where we find hope. That's where David found himself, and this is what David did. Now flip over to Psalm 32, because Psalm 32 correlates with this story, and it tells us exactly what David did. So Psalm 32 tells us, that, I mean, he, he's so repentant and, and regretful about this decision. Look at verse 3 in Psalm 32. He says, for when I kept silent, my bones did what? Wasted away. Wasted away through my groaning all day long. You, 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 know what, you know what sin does? It creates anxiety. It creates worry. It creates pain. It creates regret, emotional turmoil. Why? Because the sin is eating us away from the inside out until we become callous. This is what's happening to David. Look at verse 4 in Psalm 32. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. You know, we were laughing and joking about uh, uh, the, the sermon today and, and how it relates to music, and we started going down the, the trail of, man, Johnny Cash, George Jones, Name your pick. The outlaw country guys, they got it. But in the words of the man in black himself, prophetically experiential lyrics, you can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, what? God will cut you down. God will cut you down. You know, you know what that means? The most miserable person, this is so true, the most miserable person on the planet is not the unsaved person who is in sin. It's the saved person who is in sin. You know why? Because sin will make you miserable. It will steal your joy away. An unsaved person sinning, I mean, they're just having fun in their sin. But a saved person sinning, huh? They're living a life of regret and emotional turmoil, which, oh, by the way, is a great barometer of whether or not you are saved. Because if you're just living it up in your sin, then I, I think you should question your salvation. But, but, but David, he, he knows he's miserable. Why? Because one word, and that word's conviction. The Lord convicted him. And God's conviction should always lead to our confession. God's conviction to, should lead to our confession. And here's the turning point in Psalm 32, verse 5. It says this, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you what? forgave the iniquity of my sin. Confession covers our sin. Confession covers our sin and cleans our past. Now, what am I saying? What am I saying? The same God, listen, this is hope. 
the same God who forgave David and restored David continued to use David is the same God who can forgive you, he can restore you, and he can continue to use you. That's hope. That's redemption. That is restoration. So I'm going to tell you a story. Makes me uncomfortable. Probably make you uncomfortable. Probably make you more uncomfortable. But it will make you uncomfortable because grace is uncomfortable. All right? But this is just what God does. God is amazing grace. So Joshua Broom, he grew up in a small town in South Carolina. Joshua had high hopes in this world, and he actually grew up in church. And it, it was a church that was very legalistic, pushed him away from the Lord. So he started running. And he thought he wanted to be a Hollywood star. So what do people do if they want to be a Hollywood star? They move to Hollywood. And so in 2006, Joshua moved to Hollywood. Well, Joshua didn't get any roles, and so he started working at a local restaurant to try to just make ends meet, and he was approached by two young ladies, and they said, hey, we can help you get a role. We are adult industry stars, and we would like to get you a role in our film. And he said, you know what? I have no money. I don't know what to do. Normally, I would not do this. I'm going to do this one time and one time only. And it led him down Pandora's box of sin, where he made over 1,000 films. And he talks about his experience where he's recognized on the streets of L.A. and Hollywood, and even in South Carolina, not by his real name, Joshua, but by his stage name. He said that, I lost all of my identity. No one ever used my real name. Until one day, he walks into the bank, and the teller uses his real name, Joshua. And he said, at that point, I lost it. I broke down, and I lost it. I said, I don't know what I need to do, but I'm leaving Hollywood, and I'm going back home to South Carolina. So he moved back home to South Carolina. He tried to close the past, but he didn't know how to close it because his identity was in a role that he was disgusted over. So he started working out at a local gym, and he met a girl named Hope, and he asked Hope on a date. And Hope said yes. But he said, look, I just want to be honest with you. This is who I am. This is, this is my identity. And I love what Hope said. Hope said this. Your past doesn't define you. Only God defines you. Now that's important to hear, church. Because we live in a cancel culture where you are defined by your past and not for your soul. Now, it used to be legalistic churches had the monopoly on cancel culture. Now, liberals have the monopoly on cancel culture. But she said, no, only the Lord can define you. And he defines you by who you are, and you are a sinner. But Jesus can be your Savior. And in that gym, Joshua bowed the knee and accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. And now Joshua is known worldwide for his testimony. And I kid you not, the pastor of Good News Baptist Church. Wow. Only God. Joshua needed hope in his life. And the Lord just didn't send a girl named Hope. He sent the only hope, salvation in Christ. And it's in that hope that we find redemption 
and we find restoration. Can you pray with me?